Hey guys, it's Drake, and uh, today is going to be a book haul video. So it's been a little while since I did my last one, and I have some pretty interesting books here that I've had the fortune to get. So uh, this one here, you know, I've, <laughs> it's not hard to decide which one to start with. Well, it is actually, considering what I have over there, but. So this is uh, Alexander Thoreau's Early Stories, published by one of the best presses going today, Tough Poets Press. Um, I'll probably be making a video on them pretty soon to fill in with my best presses series. But this one here, I pre-ordered it back in, what, March? And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to afford a signed copy so got a signed copy of early stories by alexander throw so um i was pretty pleased to be able to get the early stories because uh i think darkenville's cat is the the novel i enjoy the most that he wrote so um, these early stories kind of span as from what i gather you know the three wogs to darkenville's cat era I don't know that explicitly. That could be completely wrong. It could all predate both of them. But anyway, it does kind of feel in that range. So anyway, first first awesome book, Alexander Thoreau's Early Stories. And then uh, I have another one here, which honestly was kind of a, a whim. Uh, Luis Felipe Fabre. So he's an American, or not an American, what am I saying? Mexican poet. Um, this is Cabaret Provenza. Don't really know much about it, but if you're interested, look at that there. And uh, it was like five bucks, and I had heard his name as being an interesting contemporary Mexican poet, so I was like, eh, why not? Honestly, still haven't looked into it too much. Just recently got it. So if you're interested in contemporary American, uh, why do I keep saying that? Mexican poetry, and you haven't heard of this guy, go ahead and look him up. All right, and then next here is one of my recent, just total down the rabbit hole fascinations. Along with Aliocha Cole, I have this writer here, William Goyen. William Goyen is a Texas writer, most famously known for a novel called The House of Breath, which um, I'm definitely gonna be making a video pretty soon about that one, totally amazing totally shocking that he's not extremely popular. Apparently he is pretty popular in um, translation in Germany and Spain and France, but I looked on Goodreads and his most famous book, The House of Breath, has like 130 reviews, which is horrifying. I mean, you know, I'm kind of in this realm too. I didn't even look at him that closely until... Uh, I had heard about him maybe seven years ago and got a copy. One of my friends was nice enough to give me a copy of his short stories, uh, Had I a Hundred Mouths. And I read a couple of those and it was, it was good, but it wasn't, I, basically I think I wasn't uh, mature enough at the time and just kind of had a huge gap and I just didn't pay attention and then um, someone mentioned this guy recently and it kind of reignited all of my past ideas about him and just totally down the rabbit hole. So this is his biography. It starts with trouble. That's the man himself. He was born in 1915, so he's kind of contemporary, a little bit older than Gaddis, a uh, little bit younger than, you know, Hart Crane, Hart Hemingway, a little bit younger than that crowd. Uh, he knew D.H. Lawrence's widow, he knew Stephen Spender, knew Catherine Ann Porter, actually had a romance with her. Um, so, fascinating guy. You can get his books for really cheap. If you're interested at all, go ahead and just start reading The House of Breath. It is early novels, short stories. Just, just dive in, you'll love it. So that's his biography, and I also got his selected letters. And um, I have a pretty special 
book video I'm planning related to William Goyen. Not sure when I'll be able to get it totally done, but um, yeah, get ready for that. Steven Spender, they were good friends. So it's cool that he gives an afterward. This one's published by UT, which I thought was pretty nice, the school I graduated from. And then next here is totally a surprise. Permanent Earthquake by Evan Dara. New Evan Dara novel. Who would have thunk it? The Lost Scrapbook is one of my favorite books I've ever read. And I do unfortunately have to say that I think that's his best book. You know, I think his first book was his best book. Easy Chain is good. It's up there. But it's not as good, in my opinion, as The Lost Scrapbook. And Flea, to me was nowhere near the lost scrapbook i haven't looked at this one thoroughly enough to be able to make a determination i've read the first bit still reading it but um i don't know it's definitely in a different style than um, something like the lost scrapbook but uh i at least appreciate that he has courage to make interesting language you know most most contemporary writers today the writing is so weak and cowardly and watered down it you know, it's not even worth reading. At least this is worth reading so far. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes as I um, read the whole thing and I'm able to think about it. So, Evan Dar, if you haven't gotten this one, another one of the best presses currently, which it only publishes Evan Dar's novels, but that alone puts it up there. Aurora and uh, Permanent Earthquake by Evan Dar. If you haven't gotten it, go ahead and pick it up. And then uh, next year, I have a couple... Uh, interesting American novels. This next one is one I've been wanting for a while and just went to one of my favorite bookstores in Denton, Texas, and they had a nice copy of the hardcover, Plain Song by Wright Morris. This one I'd been interested in for a while, but just never, never, never did it. Never uh, bit the bullet, <laughs> so to say. And um, yeah, I'm uh, interested in novels that are from the opposite uh, perspective so uh, female novelist writing from a male perspective or a male novelist writing from a female perspective I think those are uh, usually pretty interesting you know Virginia Woolf writing male voice and then someone like you know Wright Morris or who else Stefan Zweig writes some interesting uh, from female perspective um, but anyway so Plain Song is um, a story that follows uh, female characters in the Midwest from the 1800s to uh, the mid 20th century, from what I remember, right? Uh, I think it says it there. Oh, from the early years of the 20th century to the 1970s follows the story of the Atkins women, their relationship among themselves and the men and women in their lives. Yeah, Wright Morris, he, he wrote a lot of novels and he's really completely unknown now, so I'm excited for this one. Plain Song. You can also get really nice copies for pretty cheap, so if you're interested in it, go ahead and check that out. And then uh, here's a pretty neat one, also from the same place. The Bridge by D. Keith Mano. So this guy is uh, kind of in that same range as Gilbert Sorrentino, uh, that time frame at least. You know, started in the you know late fifties, early sixties, mid sixties, and just pumped out a bunch of novels. He writes some really interesting novels. One of them is Take Five, um, which Dalkey Archive I think publishes a lot of his in paperback. Uh, redoes them. At least take five, I know they do. But this one is The Bridge, a novel about the last man on earth, which I had never heard of this one really. I didn't look at it too closely, but um, it says here, the year is 2035. For over 40 years, the ecologists have had their way and the killing by man of any living thing has been outlawed. Insects, fish, plants, and animals abound, in fact run rampant, reverend by all but a few, such as Dominic Priest. Priest still believes in the primacy of man. In this adventure story of the future, D. Keith Mano demonstrates once again his concern as a novelist with the situation about to arise. 
the problem as yet unforeseen, the solution not yet quite arrived at. So, you have some of that post-apocalyptic dystopian stuff, and uh, D. Keith Man was an interesting writer, so I feel like he'll at least do an interesting job with it. So, the bridge. Then last year, I have two big books. Um, first one here is just probably the most beautiful book I own. Most beautiful book I've seen in a long time. This is a um, monograph of Ali Banisadr. He's a Persian, well, Iranian painter. And uh, I actually first heard of him through Andre of the Untranslated. So yet again, Andre is the is a major culprit in my enjoyment of art. I'll never be able to forgive him for that. And uh, it's interesting, he just kind of, Andre just talked about him and then this was being put out and I pre-ordered it. And it came out a little over a month ago, I think, maybe about a month ago. And it is just gorgeous. So like, look, look at this uh, cover here. And then one of the most amazing things, look at the edges of the book. It's painted too. It looks like it's painted at least, look at that. And uh, I'll just give you a glimpse into some of the pages on the inside. I might go into a little closer in another video, but um, Ali Banisadr is uh, born in the 70s, so he's still pretty young, just kind of up and coming. And uh, awesome, just awesome. The thing that I love about his paintings is that it's very reminiscent, uh, reminiscent of Hieronymus Bosch. These are some of the paintings that influence his thinking, or at least visually or symbolically, or influences. And similarities, so you guys might recognize quite a few of these, as I do. But now we get into his drawings. So he does these drawings to plan things that he's going to be painting. And then now we get to his paintings. 2007. So, and then here we get one of his first huge paintings. 47 by 48 inches, infidels. We have some more. Look at that. This one's called What the Thunder Said. And I wanna skip a little bit ahead. Okay, yeah, this is perfect. Okay, look at this. Because the, the thing that I think is amazing, so this is a close-up of this painting on the left here. What They Cannot See, 2009. And the amazing thing about his paintings is that you'll have you'll have figures that are relatively distinguishable like this. You know, you pretty much easily make out a figure here. But then on the other hand, you, you see in this corner here, it's like your brain wants to see figures and you're like, oh, okay, oh, that's a, that's a face, right? And then you're like, oh no, that's, that's not really a face. It's just like a conglomeration of <laughs> features maybe. And then, you're like, oh look, that's that has to be like shoulders and a head. No, that's it's not. It's like um, it's like I imagine someone with prosopagnosia seeing what looks like a face, and then they get closer to it. And it it's like a it's like a bush or something like that, or the other way around maybe. <laughs> looks like a hat, and uh, it's actually your your wife's face. Yeah. Just uh, amazing stuff. I'll just flip through. I mean, look at those blues. The camera doesn't even capture it. Not even close. The gatekeepers. Fourth of July. Fourth of July is coming up. And then 
There's another look at that, the merchants. Look at that red. Yeah, this, this video and of course my speech over it does not do this book justice. But yeah, I'll go into it in depth in a little, in another video, but Ali Banisadr, one of the best painters I know of, probably my favorite painter who's alive right now. So yet again, thanks Andre. Thank you very much. And lastly here, this is another one that I had pre-ordered months ago and finally came out. 2021 has been a good year so far, book-wise. This is uh, Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English. Now, for those of you with a penchant for <laughs> Southern Appalachian English or Southern American dialects, you might know that there was a 2003 edition of this book called The Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English, I believe. Yeah, Smoky Mountain English, yep. And then um, had been printed, you know, excellent. The origins of that book trace all the way to the, the CCC camps in the 30s where different people would go out and try to collect speech of uh, rural people, Appalachian folks, and uh, then they finally collected it all after tons of people collecting it and tons of people giving interviews and things, 2003, and then over the last 20 years it had been broadened out, and now they call it the Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English, and this is 1,300 pages of just words and phrases that are used in southern Appalachia just amazing like all my ancestors basically come from southern Appalachia one way or another so just hearing these little things and then of course Cormac McCarthy one of the main reasons I got this too is that you know Cormac McCarthy is this time period you know most of the people that were interviewed for a large chunk of the words in here were interviewed uh, from the 40s to the 60s uh, through the 70s and, uh, you know, that's, that's McCarthy, that's McCarthy's Appalachia right there. So, uh, just an excellent reference volume for any Southern writers, you know, and, uh, yeah, some of the funny ones, like there's a half pint Baptist, a half pint Baptist is a Baptist that you distinguish because, uh, they just drip the water on your forehead and then you have a five gallon Baptist where you get totally <laughs> drenched to be baptized. You know, just little funny things like that. Uh, I looked up mamma because I use the word mamma for my mamma. And just interesting seeing the, the origins and the, the metamorphosis of that word. So many interesting things. If you're interested at all in Cormac McCarthy, if your ancestors come from the Appalachian region, this is a must-have. It's published by the University of North Carolina Press. Just amazing. Just amazing. Also, if you're into linguistics at all, it has some of the grammar as well, the grammar differences, which um, is an interesting subject on its own, apart from the words that are used. So, yeah. Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English. I'm sure I'll go into this one more too, but I just wanted to kind of show off some, some interesting books and give a heads up for anyone who's also interested in the same things I am. Well, uh, let me know if you also got some of these books or if you've read them before, and uh, hope you enjoyed. Death is a gang, boss.